thank you everybody for joining us today for our threat detection webinar. Uh, we put together some great content for y'all on credential access and how to detect, respond to, and mitigate credential theft. So uh, a couple of housekeeping items. The first one would be this is being recorded and it will be made available to all the attendees afterwards. Uh, and if we have enough time at the end of this presentation, we'll open it up for Q&A. Uh, if we don't, don't worry. Uh, we're going to follow this presentation up with a blog post and for the uh, questions that are appropriate we will make sure that they are answered in that blog post so let's dive into some quick intros and then we'll get right into the to the content here so uh, i'm jimmy astle uh, and i lead our detection and enablement team here at red canary over to you rachel yep i'm rachel schwalk i am a detection engineer at red canary Hey, and I'm uh, Jared Myers. I'm uh, one of the city managers uh, on Overwatch at CrowdStrike. I'm Casey Nur. I'm a cybersecurity engineer at MITRE and a member of the MITRE attack team. So as you can see, we have some heavy hitters here in the industry, and we're really excited to bring some great content, educational content, and teach you all about what we see when it comes to credential access uh, and how to detect and respond to it. So here's a quick high-level overview of what we're going to go over today. Uh, kind of break this this presentation up into two pieces. We want to kind of frame and quantify what credential access is. So we'll talk about some malware families that we commonly see uh, across our customer base and, and how they abuse credential access and how. We'll give you some insights into that. Uh, also excited to share some quantitative data on what Red Canary and CrowdStrike saw in 2022 when it comes to credential access. And then we'll kind of morph that into detection engineering strategies, right? So at a high level, when it comes to detection engineering, you first need to concentrate on how you, you know, collect and observability uh, of those various pieces. So we'll give you some examples on that. And then building off that collection and that visibility, right? You wanna layer in your detections and eventually preventions or you know, settings, proactive settings to help prevent or mitigate those things in the future. And we'll be sprinkling in some testing, Atomic Red Team shout outs and things like that throughout the presentation. Uh, one big thing is, and I mentioned this earlier, uh, we'll be following up with a blog post and that blog post will, will definitely have a lot more details and we'll go into each one of the test cases that we outline here and it's complimentary uh, atomic red team test for you all to test your defenses at home from what you've learned today so without further ado let's dive into the what who and where of credential access so here's a quick abbreviated definition of how mitre attack uh sort, sort of quantifies a credential access i'm not going to read this here um, but what I will say at a high level is once attackers, you know, gain access to systems, one of their main objectives is to, to gain credentials and why? Well, it enables them to sort of break out, it enables them access to certain machines uh, and, and ultimately enables their actions and objectives. And so with that said, I will hand things over to Jared Myers so that he can help scope, you know, the, uh, the various topics that we're going to talk about here today. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what's in scope? Uh, I mean, I, I think in general, when I was talking to Jimmy about setting this up, like credential access is huge. Um, but we're going to talk about, I think, some of the most prevalent and kind of relevant techniques that that are, that are able to affect you. Um, I think Casey is going to talk a little bit about uh, credential access for clouds and SaaS services, things like that. Um, we are going to talk about lateral movement. I feel like that's peanut butter and jelly, biscuits and gravy, like the two just like go together hand in hand. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how uh, not all credential access is the same. Um, there's things that can happen on like a local system, and then there's things where you get like an entire DC compromised, and those are, are very far apart in the realm of like how, how bad is my afternoon going to be. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. So yeah, let's move into the next slide, Jimmy. So why credential theft? Um, Ultimately, because it enables lateral movement. Um, I mean, unless it is like a very targeted pen test or something like that, like no one's trying to steal your credentials just to say they have them. Like the ultimate goal of getting the credentials is to get access to systems, get access to different uh, segments of the network, kind of all these things that you just have to have this uh, for the, the threat actors to kind of do, you know, whatever they're after as far as like the, the crux of their mission. Um, but like I said earlier, like they just go hand in hand. Um, it says there like you can't perform lateral movement without credentials like there is that asterisk there there's uh like vulnerabilities like the smb thing that was going around a couple of years ago i mean like there's ways to do it but more often than not even when we're seeing some of those types of things 
once they're moving to kind of some of these uh, disparate systems, there reaches a point where uh, they don't have older vulnerable systems that are unpatched and things like that. At some point, they still have to either uh, get plain text credentials, dumb credentials, like start hitting up uh, DCs and things like that uh, to, to like fully be able to kind of get in everywhere they want inside the environment. Um, that second bullet point, like Jimmy and I were talking, like not a single ransomware incident has happened where credentials were not stolen. I I feel like that's probably true. Like I hate to say like never, but I would I would actually be interested to see where that if if someone could be like yeah no I, here is an example of where that happened. I, I just I've never seen it, and we've yeah. done with a lot of this. So it's the it's gut, the gut feeling, right? Like yeah, yeah. It, it's, I, mean, I hate to say never, but like I definitely feel like I, people would be hard pressed to come up with that. Um, and ultimately, like getting credentials is easier than like coming up with exploits. Um, everyone likes to talk about like zero days and end days and things like that. Those are expensive and like hard to come up with. Like me sending something to your aunt and getting them to put their credentials into, you know, like a web browser, that is easy. And we, wherever you work, I don't care where you work, like you have someone in your company that cannot wait to click on a link and start typing in their credentials and like it just as ha just as quickly as that it happens so we see that a lot dumpy credentials is not you know like a big feat either so and i think that last point is a huge point to be quite honest with you so even um if you if you listen to a lot of people they're like oh you know like we stop ransomware we do all these things and that's great like that's if that is all you have left between you and like a horrible weekend that's great but like being able to stop it in some of these earlier stages before the ladder move, before they actually start dumping credentials and things like that, and then being able to actually monitor and identify, uh, you know, different uh, identification attacks, I think is, is hugely important. And, and I agree with that bullet point a lot, Jimmy. So, yeah, and, and I would just foot stomp that, you know, as defenders, you know, and as we communicate publicly, a lot of the times it's like, hey, monitor LSAS, look for weird process injection techniques or look for open process handles to web browsers. Um, that Those are absolutely good tools to have in your toolbox. But I will also say that um, monitoring identity logon events for both on-premise or enterprise systems and clouds is a really good way to detect when credentials have been compromised and when they are being used in your enterprise. Uh, and I know Casey and Rachel will speak to that uh, in, in some, some follow-up slides here. So Jimmy, I'll hand it back over to you. I know you're going to talk a little bit about this and then get into some of the stats that you talked about. Just yeah. So. Yep. So what we thought we would do is kind of quantify credential access. You know, I, I definitely like to take sort of like a scientific approach to some of these things when it comes to detection engineering. So when it comes to credential access, there's 49 sub techniques uh, that are, and, and when I was in MITRE Attack Navigator, I clicked on Linux, Windows, Mac, and, and you know, cloud and SaaS things that are in there. Uh, and as Jared alluded to, OS credential dumping is certainly the most popular. Uh, there's an asterisk there because like all data sets, it can be skewed on how you observe it. Uh, you know, between uh, certainly at Red Canary, one of our most popular data sources that we have is from enterprise endpoints, right? And so that's where we see it. And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but not, not to be confused with the sort of LSAS dumping or, or some of the other techniques that we'll get into, brute forcing, we tend to see as a really, really popular technique. And that enables access to cloud systems and endpoint initial access vectors. And sometimes, you know, it's as simple as I forgot to turn my firewall back on and I, I was plugged into, you know, the library's network uh, and, and somebody started banging on your door. Uh, we see that quite frequently. Um, and, you know, it's not just about like the operating system credentials that we see adversaries targeting. Uh, and we'll get this into, into more detail too. Uh, I think Rachel will dive into this. We see adversaries and malware targeting application stores. So like the Windows, the, the built-in application stores in Windows, but also web browsers. As you can imagine, um, it's a little bit more stealthier to go after the browser passwords, right? And one could argue that the browser passwords might be more uh, advantageous given, you know, adversaries actions on objectives uh, for gaining access to various applications within the enterprise. So let's talk about those numbers. So this is what, uh, so what you're looking at here is a histogram of all of the threats that Red Canary has shipped in 2022 made up of all of those 49 credential access uh, sub techniques. And this data is pretty telling right off the bat, right? Um, first of all, right, it, clearly adversaries are using this, right? Uh, so great, as a defender, you know, we wanna concentrate on some of these areas because it gives us the ability to detect attacks earlier on, right? And that is the name of the game. Uh, some of the other things that, that are very clear from this data, some of the techniques are being used a lot more than others, right? The, the T1003001, that's LSAS memory, 
Uh, clearly that one is a lot more popular than others. There are two kind of caveats to this data that I wanna point out. The first one is from a red canary standpoint, we treat testing, customer testing as threats. So uh, if a customer is running Atomic Red Team, maybe they're running a commercial tool, or maybe they've rolled their own tool uh, internally to test their defenses. First of all, that's awesome. Uh, and we love that. But when it comes to shipping threats to our customers, we don't like to err on the side of, oh, that must be testing. We just ship those things and the customers will communicate to us, hey, yep, that was testing. Thank you uh, very much. And, but, but when it comes to sort of quantifying the data, we like to include that in here because it is an important piece of uh, any security program. Uh, and the other thing here, and I alluded to it earlier, is that you know we observe a lot of our data from enterprise systems via EDR sensors. And so this data um, can certainly be more, more heavily weighted towards um, attack techniques from enterprise systems. That's not to say that there aren't cloud or SaaS detections in here. It's just, uh, there's just a lot more of the enterprise techniques that we see uh, in active intrusions and testing from a day-to-day -day basis. So what I'm gonna do real quick now is kind of turn this data on its head and let's look at it from a pie chart point of view, because I think this tells a much better picture. So in all of 2022 of those 49 sub techniques for credential access, 60% of those were those LSAS memory. And so Rachel's gonna go into a bit more detail on what that is, some of the common techniques that we observe, but at the end of the day, right, it's tools like Mimikatz, it's living off the land with API calls like mini dump, write dump. Uh, it's, hey, I just go into task manager and right click and hit dump on LSAS, right? It is a very popular technique. And as a defender, if you're, if you're trying to figure out where to start, that is exactly where you would start. Uh, coming in at number two, at a, uh, just over eight and a half percent is proc file system. Uh, so on POSIX operating systems, that's Linux, Mac OS, Unix, uh, you know, any process that starts will create a file in the slash proc file system. There's a lot of tools out there that will enumerate those files and pull uh, credentials that may be in memory out from the proc file system. Uh, this number might be a little bit skewed because uh, when I was looking at the data, we had a customer that deployed Mimi penguins via Ansible on their Linux fleet. Uh, and so a lot of those numbers uh, came up and it was testing. But again, like I said, we ship those uh, just to make sure we're doing the right thing for our customers. The third one coming in a little over 6% is credentials and files. And we have, we'll have some examples there later on. But uh, actually, Casey will have some good examples here. And, and I think the cloud is a really great example where, uh, say, a developer has a hidden file on their desktop that contains API keys to give them access to cloud services like AWS or Azure or Google Cloud. Um, this is a common technique that we see adversaries searching for on file systems. Fourth, at you know a little under 6%, is Etsy password and Etsy shadow. Again, this falls into the POSIX operating system family. Um, it's, a, it's actually kind of like a dual use technique, in my opinion, because uh, adversaries will enumerate these files to find out what users are on the systems, but they will also exfiltrate these files uh, and they can take them offline um, and perform some password cracking to, to unlock those hashes for weaker passwords. Uh, and to touch a little bit about what Jared said on not all credential theft should be created equal, uh, coming in at number five, uh, a little over 5%, again, is NTDS dumping. Uh, to me, uh, you know, given context, this is probably one of the most severe credential dumping techniques that you should that, that can happen in your enterprise. And this is very specific to Active Directory. Uh, and so there's techniques that, uh, that the threat actors will use to, uh, first of all, they need to gain access to your Active Directory systems, either locally or remotely. Uh, and then they will, uh, through NTDS dumping, dump the entire Active Directory database. Typically, they'll take that back onto their command and control systems and leverage tools to decrypt that database. And so at that point, the adversary now has every username and password inside of your Active Directory domain. Uh, and as a defender, uh, that is where you, all the bells need to go off and your response needs to be very quick. But again, uh, we'll go into more details, Casey uh, and Rachel will go into more details on these. But Jared, I want to pause here for a second. Does this jive with what y'all see at CrowdStrike and Overwatch in terms of, you know, you guys have some of the best data, some of the best visibility in the industry. Um, you know, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, so when we're kind of putting these together, I mean, we started working on our own charts, but I mean, ultimately it, it kind of told the same exact picture. I mean, like um, a lot of what you see is uh, touching LSS because it works, everyone knows about it. There's a, there's a ton of tools for it. I mean, I think there are definitely um, some of the cooler kids are, are starting to move away from that because it is so like heavily monitored. But I mean, it's still like the low hanging fruit that everyone goes after first just because there's, 
so many people I don't think that are that are looking in a meaningful way to even see if this is occurring, to be quite honest with you. But yeah, I mean, this this lines up exactly with, I, I think, what we're seeing. If you kind of remove all the custom tools, which is like a, a larger, like, you know, bucket that we throw a lot of things in, they, they can be everything from just, you know, home rolled tools, like you said, everything else. Mimi Cats is still probably like the biggest tool that we see for credential theft and things like that. And it's because it works. It's a good tool. Um, and I think a lot of those like custom binaries that we see are really just like pieces and parts of a lot of different tools like that and, you know, Raccoon, like all these other ones that they've just compiled into Go or something like that. But um, I mean, it, it works and there's a lot of people using it and it's low hanging fruit. Um, and everyone, I mean, everyone is, is like the cobalt strike of, you know, things like everyone uses it from like, you know, kids that are learning about red team in college up to like, you know, like nation states and everyone else. So, yeah, I agree yeah. with you on that. Yeah, so hopefully the audience like this, you know, we, we wanted to come here and actually quantify why credential access is so important uh, and why some of this follow on content that we're going to show you uh, is going to be great take home material uh, to go improve your defenses. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand it over to Casey now uh, to sort of talk about the relationships to on prem services versus cloud services and why we should all be aware of that. Uh, yeah, so in a lot of modern enterprise environments, cloud and on-prem infrastructure are connected. And the way this is usually achieved is through synchronizing identities, because users don't want a thousand different credentials for a thousand different services. They want to be able to take their Active Directory passwords and log into all the cloud or SaaS services that they need to log into. And adversaries can take advantage of this, whether they're kind of starting on-prem or in the cloud because one set of credentials is only one set of credentials to steal. And so in its simplest form, this can simply be gaining a user account's credentials and then using those to access uh, their OneDrive files. And um, here's things like token theft are really critical because you can often get around multi-factor authentication requirements. But with high privileges, uh, things can get a lot more interesting because adversaries can start targeting those kind of key synchronization mechanisms that actually connect those user identities between Active Directory and these other services. So they can use that to start collecting users' passwords and gain access to additional resources for lateral movement. And so as a result, we can't really consider cloud and on-prem environments as being isolated from one another. A threat to one is, is very much a threat to both. And uh, here in comes kind of the shared responsibility model, which is this idea that cloud providers and cloud customers are going to have different responsibilities when it comes to security. And um, a lot of times how this plays out in practice is when you kind of sign up for a cloud service, there are a lot of promises about how secure this service is. But when breaches happen, usually the cloud provider is going to blame the, the customer because maybe they leaked their access keys on GitHub, or maybe they have publicly exposed S3 buckets, or maybe they're, ha they're having two excessive IAM permissions. And so I guess a lot of the time, there are these issues where people might think things are secure by default or not have a great understanding of all their responsibilities for all these different systems and different types of systems too. And so credential access is really key here because it can be very difficult for cloud providers to really defend against these sorts of things. And additionally, they can um, be tricky to detect um, sometimes. So your credentials are kind of going everywhere in the cloud. So it's really key to think of that as uh, important to secure and not just something that's protected by default. Agree, agree. Uh, so next we're gonna get into kind of who is stealing credentials and what is stealing credentials. Absolutely. So I love this, um, this slide that you put together, Jimmy. Um, I, I think um, ultimately threat actors, whether they are, uh, you know, motivated by money, whether they're after data, whether they're after their IP, I feel like all threat actors at some point will just hoard credentials, keys, like whatever it is. Um, and we used to just say passwords and things like that, but it, it's really a lot more than that now. Like it's tokens, it's keys, it's kind of all these things. Um, Ultimately, when you're kind of in a maze that has a ton of locked doors and you don't know where you have to get, like anything that you can pick up along the way that you think can help, that I mean, that's, that's just what they do. 
Uh, they come in a lot of time with some credentials or they get credentials on the first box they get. But I mean, every chance that they get, they'll get them. And even after, I mean, if they've established these beachheads and they've been in environments forever, I mean, it's not like they stop. They just come back in, steal credentials on a cadence at that point. So let's talk about like who steals them, why they steal them. This slide, the next couple of slides, these all kind of in, in, uh, weave kind of in and out together. Um, access brokers, uh, which was on the last slide, is kind of a, a big one. Um, this is a huge market, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, just stealing credentials and selling access to places um, makes millions, if not billions of dollars a year, probably, to be quite honest with you. From a threat actor standpoint, um, and I think most businesses are used to kind of this model of this, you just outsource things that you don't really want to have to deal with anymore. And I think like access has is, is become like a huge opportunity for that, where we see these groups that their entire purpose is they're uh, going after known vulnerabilities, but there's oftentimes like open source, uh, you know, like exploits to go after them. They're going uh, after like massive phishing scams like spray and pray. Uh, and then they'll get access to some of these environments. They'll check it out. And then based upon where they're at, the potential of money, things like that, they just start selling them, uh, you know, in different forms and things like that. From a ransomware, you know, like let's say from a ransomware actor perspective, like I, you just removed like the first hurdle for me, you know, so I can pick out targets that I think will be beneficial if if I'm after them, maybe because it's that kind of hacktivism type stuff, like, you know, I want to target a specific organization, you've removed that first kind of boundary. So I can go in now and typically we put out a, a report in the spring and it had a, kind of a, a time in there of like how quickly we would see lateral movement occur. And I want to say the average was like 100 or an hour and 20 minutes, um, which is very fast if you think about it. It's also the yeah. average. So, I mean, like, ultimately, like, we were seeing much faster in some scenarios. So when um, when you do leverage these access brokers, these ransomware crews, some of these other things, and sometimes, like, people think, like, oh, access brokers have just provided access. Like, a lot of times they come with, like, here's systems that you can hit with this. Here's a base, you know, topology of the network. You know, and, like, all those things are just kind of add-ons and modules that they'll throw in to kind of sweeten the deal. So a lot of times when these, especially the ransomware crews come in, they know that, you know, like, they're in there there's a chance that something will trip up if the tools will go off. So they quickly start moving laterally as quickly as they can, getting these credentials, mapping out their game plan, and, and then it's on. You know, and by the time that you start seeing computers blue screen, like it is it's way too late at that point. And kind of some of these initial things that we're talking about where the access brokers were in before, like really even anyone was in there to do kind of like the, the actual like ransomware type campaign is where you need to kind of like focus on, on stopping these and detecting it and kind of putting a stop to it. So threat groups aren't any different. Um, like if you look at like your, your nation states, your, your low footprint espionage related groups, um, they'll take however they can get in as well. Uh, I think personally, like after they're done in some environments, they're probably selling off things too, just to see it get burned to the ground later uh, and muddy the water. Um, but let's talk, let's actually look at some of the tools. And we picked out, uh, this is just kind of a, a list here, but we picked out just some, some fairly common ones to be quite honest with you. Um, the two at the bottom, if we go to the next slide, the two at the bottom um, are kind of like the granddaddies of them all to be quite honest with you. Like I've mentioned Mimi Cats uh, numerous times on this call. We're can, Continue to see it used, like it's a good tool. Um, and I mean, every everyone uses it, to be quite honest with you. Um, Redline is another one to steal creds from browsers. Raccoon um, is awesome. Raccoon was fairly young. I think that the, the author of that got busted in like, like just last year, like a couple of months ago um, in like a, a Porsche or something. I'm sure he had stacks of cash. <laughs> and stuff. Like to use his malware, you paid, it was like, $200 a month or something, which doesn't seem like a lot. Like if it, and if you think about that from a business standpoint, you stand to make a million dollars a year, you can spend $200 a month to get, you know, like credential access. And I think when they, when the feds took him down, it was like with us in, in EU, um, like he had something like 50 million unique credentials. Like that's, that's a lot of credentials. And like, he was, he was like 26 and like doing this in his spare time, like God knows what he did before this, but like he, he found a market and he made it. And like, this is why it, it's just going to continue to be so much bigger. But yeah, Raccoon was sent out in like email, just everywhere. It was everywhere for a while. Um, Qbot, Zloader, they really are, 
I mean, they're a decade old at this point, probably, or like variants of them, like Quackbot and Z Loader comes from like the old Zeus. Um, but they they just go after credentials and like they they soak them up because they don't know if they need to use them in kind of a furtherance of another phishing attack, if they want to use them for lateral movement. There's a thousand ways that they can use them. It's one of those things like, well, let's collect all the wood. We'll figure out what we're going to build with it later. Um, and if you don't have, uh, I think, kind of good you know hygiene, if you're not aware of this is going on, if you're allowing passwords to be stored in the browser, I mean, like all these things, like as an organization that you can kind of help to chisel away that this is going to be like less of a threat to you. The more that you can do for that MFA, all that, I think is just a, a much bigger thing altogether. So let's go to the next slide. So let's talk about some actual threat groups here. Um, Team TNT, uh, I think they gained notoriety probably two years ago, like a 2020 time frame. Like they were targeting uh, like all the containers and dockers and they were helping to map it out. Um, I, I think as businesses, and, and, and we see this time and time again, um, organizations uh, move to things that save them money, save them resources, you know, overhead and things like that. Oftentimes, um, it is very much like a monetary decision. They're like, oh, uh, this is going to save us money, so we're going to move things there. And at no point like is like security typically like deeply involved in that decision, and they'll move things over. And Team TNT, if nothing else, like did a great job of highlighting like all the vulnerabilities, all the problems with like doing that at such like a neck break speed. Um, we're still seeing them active, but it's it's not nearly as at the height that it was. Like I think like 2020 was probably like their heyday. Um, APT 29, the Bears, uh, Cozy, the Dukes. I mean, like they go by a thousand names. Like APT 29 is a legit group. Um, I would say credentials and and being able to hunt on identity is probably one of the few ways to really like hone in on like this type of activity quite honest with you what they're talking about there that saml token token access and, they, and correct me if i'm wrong jimmy that's uh like solar winds solar gate solaria gate yep. however we want to pronounce yep. it um where yeah they were they were basically like they would get in they would uh like forge tokens and then use those to to you know like do all kinds of things like it was um they didn't get in through credential theft, but that was immediately what they went to. I mean, you know, like they kind of opened the door and cracked everything open for what we now know is like this giant, um, uh, like um, supply chain compromises. Like that was like the, the term in the last couple of years because of these guys. But once they got in, the first thing they did was they still went after credentials because like that's what you have to have is additional access. Profit Spider UNC, it's another like just known um, access broker. Um, and, and what Jimmy was talking about earlier that like that NTDS did, like they love to go after that. Like that is the Holy Grail. Like if they can get to, to that, they can decrypt it. And, and then there's just so much and because that it's typically got everything in it. Um, I mean, it just allows the adversary to pick out like these weird service accounts that, you know, probably should not have RDP access and all these kind of things that no one's looking at. Um, and they they could sell it off at such a high dollar value, and it's been very beneficial for them. And they have a very long history of of selling to very aggressive, borderline like violent uh, ransomware groups. To be quite honest with you, and then Lapsus um, is another one that I, I think kind of popped up over the last couple of years. I think this goes really big into what Casey was talking about earlier. Like we used to just be talking about like credentials and passwords and things like that. But if you're talking about uh, API keys and tokens, like all of these things, um, like I have to imagine at some point they're just like, oh, you know, like let's see if this works. Like let's search GitHub for, you know, like some of these like AWS keys and things like that. And then they're like, surely this is a one-off. And then like, you know, like it was just thousands and thousands. And that made a huge name for them. Like that, that, that is kind of how they got their start. Um, and I think there's just a lot of, of organizations that, that have gotten much better around like protecting, you know, domain controls, better around protecting like uh, like local admin stores and things like that. But there's still kind of like these one-offs where you have an engineer that puts something in a script and then that script got pushed and now, you know, now it's on GitHub and like it definitely shouldn't be there or somewhere else. I mean, there's a lot of places that it could be. Yeah. So and I would just say like a high level observation here too, Jared, is. Um, a lot of these actors or threat groups um, are really cloud. Uh, they're really good at their cloud tactics, right? They've shown their hand. Uh, APT29, for example, uh, clearly showed the world that they are experts in understanding the intricacies of, of the various cloud tools that are out there. Uh, I think Team TNT gets the award for 
uh, most opportunistic attacker who uh, who <laughs> exploits that shared responsibility model, right, Casey? Um, and and lapses too, right? And so, you know, as a defender, just just I would challenge you to 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 broaden your horizon in in um, the cloud, the various ways to detect threats in the cloud, because attackers today, yesterday, like they are they are they know that it's a it's low hanging fruit to, to gain access to credentials, which in turn gives them access to enterprise systems. No, I agree with you 100%. I mean, like as as we continue to move more in the clouds, like as companies and organizations, like we're, they're gonna go there too. Like that's just how it works. Um, I know Rachel is gonna talk a little bit now about like where our cred's at and I'll let her take it over. Yeah, uh, so basically your credentials are everywhere. Really like this toy story meme for it but you know they're in applications that you use on your devices they're being passed all over your network they're in the cloud sso you know it's everywhere i mean you can't do anything without credentials so i'll move into a bit more specifics like so with windows you know you got your local credential theft so this could include stuff like theft of local admin credentials which if you don't have, you know, good hygiene in place that could be used across systems. Um, you know, you would hope that not all local admins have the same password, but it's worth a shot, you know, you never know. Uh, Stranger things have happened. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, then there's your domain accounts. And so that could, you know, be used for cloud account access. They might have the same password, it could be used to get into SSO the user's OneDrive account, SharePoint. So get a lot of good information from those sources. Um, it could even, you know, be used to get into other devices. You could RDP into other boxes uh, across the network. So another access point there. Then we've got our domain cred theft, which that's when you're going to have a really, really bad day and a really, really bad month, honestly. <laughs> Uh, trying to remediate that situation. Um, so you're going to be dealing with, you know, if they dump your Active Directory database, they've got that forever, you know, to dump all your users and their passwords, everything. Um, not easy to remediate that. And, you know, also your users probably reuse those credentials uh, all over the place. So just allows for access into other uh, areas just because people like to reuse their passwords. Uh, you've also got the chance to dump creds on an Active Directory integrated system. So if somebody dumps creds on your Exchange server, they're going to have a lot of cached creds on that box, um, a lot of high privilege credentials as well. And then there's also, you know, curb roasting. So it's going to abuse the Kerberos protocol and harvest a bunch of password hashes for Active Directory user accounts uh, that have that SPN value in them. Uh, we've got the application credential theft, so targeting browsers. You know, people love to store their credentials in browsers and password managers and the Windows credential manager, which is going to have even like network credentials in it. Um, all kinds of things there. And then a really fun one is that process token manipulation because uh, that's just going to abuse native windows api functions to copy access tokens from existing processes and then you can elevate your security context you can go from admin to system level and then you can go to remote systems and you don't even need to dump credentials it's super great you don't you know you don't have to deal with that password cracking at all yeah and there's a great blog there that red canary made Get, gets more into that and how that's abused. Uh, for Linux and Mac, a uh, little bit different, you know, you've got SSH keys, uh, discovery and theft of those can lead to access to other systems. Uh, on Mac, you have your login keychain, system keychain, local items, uh, all the login data for there. You've got certificate data in there and iCloud information that gets synced. Uh, application password dumping. So this is kind of, you know, when something like Mimi Penguin comes in and it looks for these applications such as OpenSSH and Apache 2, that's going to have those clear text credentials in memory and it'll go in there and it'll start looking for those and the memory to then just take those clear text creds 
be able to use them elsewhere. And then you're hash dumping. So if we take, you know, Etsy shadow and Etsy password, can take that and crack that offline. I'll pass it to Casey. Uh, yeah, uh, so first, uh, in terms of kind of cloudy attacks, if you have the AWS command line uh, interface, it can store uh, credentials for the user in their home directory under AWS credentials. And uh, the idea behind this is just so the users don't have to you know, enter their credentials in the command line. But if you're storing credentials in this way, then these files are just uh, plain text. So uh, an adversary that's on the system can go and read those and use them. And the key here is how much permissions uh, these access keys actually have. So what can they do? Are they limited in scope? Um, are they like alerting if the basically the adversary tries to kind of take them out of their context and use them? So kind of considering all this context behind the key um, and what permissions it actually has is, is really crucial here. Uh, the second uh, thing I wanted to point out is the cloud metadata API. So this is provided by a bunch of different cloud platforms uh, as a way for applications to get information about running virtual instances. And so this is usually an IP like 169.254, 169.254, and it's uh, accessible internally. So again, if an adversary has kind of local access, then they can try to make queries. They might get some sensitive data back. Uh, but one way in which this has been kind of exploited is through server-side request forgery vulnerabilities in like public web applications. So an adversary finds this kind of public website uh, on like a cloud-hosted kind of web server, and then they exploit an SSRF vulnerability and get that website to kind of spit back out credentials. And so suddenly now from no access at all, they have these access keys. And again, what matters here is what permissions they have what can then they go and do with them? This uh, next fit, malicious OAuth applications has a bit of a social engineering element. So OAuth is this framework that allows users to grant authorization to applications to perform certain actions or uh, see certain resources. And the idea behind it is users don't have to provide their credentials directly to the application what they can do is uh, basically grant the permissions and the application receives this token. Uh, what adversaries can do is go and register malicious OAuth applications that request way too many permissions from users and then use those for ill. And this can be a bit tricky to detect on behalf of users because the, it won't kind of appear quite the same as like a typical phishing email with like a somewhat sketchy URL because it's a legitimately registered application. They'll kind of go through the typical access granting process. So that's something to kind of keep in mind for. The next bit I wanted to talk about is these hybrid identities I was mentioning earlier. So there's all sorts of different ways in which you could kind of sync your user identities between cloud services and on-prem. And uh, one popular way to do this is Active Directory Federation Services. So creating this trust relationship between Active Directory and some other cloud or SaaS service. And um, here, basically, adversaries can go after this uh, token signing certificate. So they can decrypt it and use it to forge SAML tokens with various different claims um, and user identities. Uh, the next two uh, are basically a zero AD and AD only. So pass through authentication um, when a user is authenticating to Azure AD. It forwards that authentication request to an on-prem PTA agent, which then validates those credentials against Active Directory. And adversaries can come out this from two different ways. So if they have high privileges on-prem, they might kind of load up a malicious DLL into the PTA agent, and then that could allow them to kind of passively credit collect user credentials as they log in, or maybe uh, kind of just passively accept all authentication requests. If they're coming in from the cloud and they have high privileges there, then they can register a new PTA agent that does the same thing from the web console. So kind of two different directions. Password hash synchronization syncs passwords between Azure AD and Active Directory with just two, uh, I think it's two high-privileged on-prem accounts. 
So the idea is now all authentication to Azure AD can happen in the cloud. Um, but these are just normal on-prem accounts, right? They're high privileged, but adversaries can target them like they would other high privileged accounts. So the idea behind all of this is mostly that cloud services aren't isolated. When you kind of incorporate the cloud into your environment, you're sharing your users and your keys and your files and your passwords. And so all of this should be treated as basically security critical, a, a threat to kind of one user in the cloud can translate into access on-prem or vice versa. Yeah, and, and Casey, you did a really good job explaining the complications of IAM with these cloud services. I can tell you like one of the most technically complicated things I've experienced is managing permissions in the cloud, right? Because the last thing you want to do is give this overly permissive key and then all of a sudden, like you said, someone gets it and it's bad. And so it's it's a very difficult process of troubleshooting. It's not it's not super streamlined. I can so so I can see the path of least resistance typically is to give a more, you know, open key versus that that more restrictive key. So yeah, I, I agree. And you typically kind of see see the results of that, um, you know, based on some of these checking keys into GitHub or or into a, a I don't know, a pie pie or something like that. Uh, yeah, so next we wanted to go over different tools and data sources for kind of seeing what's going on with credential access and just like observing all these behaviors we talked about. Uh, so first with the cloud, I don't want to go like too deep into kind of specifics of each different type of logging service, but I wanted to point out that there are a lot of logging and monitoring services that are in cloud environments and just like available, like you can just enable them. So AWS CloudWatch and CloudTrail and Google Cloud Monitoring and Cloud Logging, they'll keep track of resource usage, they'll keep track of API calls just all those sorts of things. And you could really observe here for particularly weird behaviors around key and credential usage, um, which I'll get into in a second. And then Azure AD audit logs and sign-in logs and identity pro protection. Here, all of this can help you figure out basically weird user kind of behavior. So maybe risky sign-ins or sign-ins from kind of weird locations and really flag just like, this user isn't kind of logging in from an expected place at an expected time, and you should really go and pay attention to that. So just kind of taking advantage of all these features is useful. Uh, so in terms of like what kind of fields to be mindful of, uh, here we have which IP address is actually calling all those APIs. So are they located in your region? Do they belong to your AWS account? Do they belong to the service that is kind of associated with those keys or typically makes those calls? Because if you basically are expecting like a particular EC2 instance to always make these kind of calls and use this key and suddenly something completely different in a completely different region, not in your AWS account is doing that, that's something to flag. You might want to look at the user agent string. So this will tell you more about kind of where the API is being called from. So for instance, in an AWS environment, you may typically see it related to the AWS management console or kind of an EC2 instance. But if it's something very unusual, maybe it's kind of indicates the use of Kali Linux or something that's not typical, that should be flagged. You should keep in mind kind of who is taking these API actions. Is it a user account? Is it a service account? Is it basically the account you expect it to? For uh, device types in particular, you should um, keep in mind this concept of kind of registering devices. In particular in Azure AD, uh, you can register devices so you can kind of join them to the domain. And if you're seeing unregistered devices, then that can be regarded as suspicious. And in some cases you can even block those with conditional access policies. Uh, however, it's also good to keep in mind that we've seen in the wild some adversaries who actually go and register devices so they can get around these policies. So that's something to kind of think about too. Uh, for event source, is it uh, like kind of what's being invoked here? Are we looking at S3 buckets? Are we looking at kind of IAM permissions, the security token service? Often adversaries will just try to kind of enumerate a bunch of stuff when they first get access. So that's something to kind of look at, like what are they actually calling? And for event names, what's actually happening? Some events are worth paying 
paying kind of special attention to, especially around like secrets requests. If there are events that are kind of rarely or never called, that's something that you want to look at, especially if maybe they're associated with like particular machines um, that typically call them and now they're being called by something different. In some cases, if an adversary gets a key, the first thing that they wanna do is figure out who it is, what it can do. So they might call something like get caller identity in AWS. Um, or try to start, again, enumerating various services. So that's something to look at too. Yeah, and um, as someone who like grew up on the endpoint side of detection and response, my simple, like the, if you're not super familiar with, you know, detection and response in the cloud, my silly analogy would be recording IP addresses and user agents is like the process start and process command lines of like the endpoint, right? Like if you were to request, if you were to pick anything if you had the, you know, the minimum viable to do detection and response in the cloud, it's IP addresses and user agents calling, you know, the, making those API actions start from there, um, figure out what their baselines are in your environment and you'll get, you'll have great success uh, in at least figuring out, hey, why is this developer using our root key from their home computer? Like that's only supposed to happen from the cloud from these sanctioned machines, right? Uh, as Casey was alluding to. All right, we'll hand it over to Rachel now to, to go over some endpoint insights. Yeah, so you're gonna, you know, want to be able to get some telemetry from your endpoints if you want to catch credential theft. Uh, there are some different options like enterprise ADR solutions, you know, such as CrowdStrike Falcon, and that'll help you generate telemetry and detect and respond to these credential theft attempts. Uh, but you know, there are also open source solutions available, such as Sysmon, which will monitor these types of events. Um, there are versions for both Windows and Linux, so that's pretty awesome there. And it'll provide very verbose logging, so it's kind of best if you can send that data into something like a SIM. Um, Mac is a little bit more difficult. There's no sysmon for it, but there is OS query, uh, and that's really good for querying against activity going on on your operating system. Um, so you can write like SQL-based queries and then you can even set like a scheduled task basically to run that query on a certain amount of time. And you can then see any OS state changes there. Uh, but at a minimum, you're going to wanna capture the process creations, the command lines, network connections, and file mods to detect on credential access. And here are some of the data sources like Windows event IDs and Sysmon IDs that are good to look out for. Uh, you definitely want to, you know, log your sign-in success, admin sign-ins, and failed sign-ins, uh, because then you know you can see with your failed sign-ins if a brute force attempt is occurring. Um, you can see across the network where you know where is this account trying to log into? Are they trying different hosts in the environment? Um, and process creation, I put there for. Windows event ID, and then one is for Sysmon. Uh, a lot of these uh, file creation for Sysmon, it's for Windows and Linux and Sysmon. The process access is only for Windows. Uh, and there's network connection that's for Sysmon, Windows and Linux. Uh, also good to look for PowerShell execution because you know adversaries love that. They love their lull bins. Uh, and then there are also some good Windows event IDs for Kerberos logging. Uh, it's also a great idea to turn on auditing for any processes that attempt to access LSAS. Uh, this was introduced in Windows 10, and that can be enabled in your audit policy configurations. All right, now let's get to my favorite part on detecting. Uh, and I'll also go over you know, some ways that you can probably try to mitigate some of these risks of credential theft as well. Right, Windows accounts. So this is, you know, that big piece of the pie you saw earlier, that LSAS memory dumping that everybody's crazy about. Uh, people love to use the built-in Windows tools for this because it's sneaky, right? Like, sure you can use Mimikatz, but why do that when everybody has run DLL 32 on their box? Um, and you can use the comm services DLL, got that mini dump function, you just need the PID of LSAS, then you just dump it to a file. Um, sometimes adversaries will get sneaky and they'll use the ordinal value for 
mini dump. And so that's going to be that number 24. You can detect on that in the command line as well. Um, so look for run DLL 32 containing 24 and that comm services, or you can also look for full in that command line. Uh, then we've got your other uh, living off the land binary usage for this, the Windows Task Manager, where Jimmy mentioned earlier, it's super easy to open that up, look at LSAS running, right click that and dump it to a file. Uh, there are other processes that you can use for that or programs that you can get. That's going to be where your Mimikatz comes in, your Process Explorer, and your proc dump. Um, so to catch those, it's probably best to just look for a file mod that has LSAS in the file name, uh, ends with a .dmp, so dump file, and look for that for any process that's writing that that isn't LSAS. And we've also got the security account manager. That's a database file that contains your local accounts for the host, but just because it's a local account doesn't mean it can't be used elsewhere. So adversaries still love to get those. And uh, that can be used by the registry tool and you can export hives uh, to that contain those credentials for offline access. So detect on reg.exe with the command line containing save or export and SAM, our system, our security. And this is gonna be the Windows domain. Uh, so if, if somebody's dumping your AD database, what do you wanna look for? Look for the built-in Windows utility, again, Living off the land binary, super easy to do this. NTDS util with a file modification of ntds.dit. Good indicator there that that got written to disk somewhere. Uh, process NTDS util with command line of ifm create. And that'll create uh, your ntds.dit file from a volume shadow copy for offline use. So it doesn't even have to be you know, on the Active Directory server. It can be from a backup. Uh, and then just look for any process that has a command line containing ntds.dit and copy. And we've also got Kerber roasting. So uh, that's gonna try to harvest password hashes from service with, from accounts with service principal names. Uh, we've got several ways to do that with PowerShell Empire, there's Rubius, and then there's also the set SPN utility. But one way that we can try to mitigate this would be to use group managed service accounts because it's going to set really strong passwords and cycle passwords every 30 days to where if those hashes are stolen, well, it's only valid 30 days and hopefully they won't be able to crack them that fast because really strong passwords. And then we've got password stores. Um, so the Windows Credential Manager uh, stores credentials for signing into websites, applications, and other devices on the network. Uh, you can dump those creds with Vault CMD, and it'll have that slash list creds and keyword Windows credentials. Uh, you can also do this with RunDLL32 as well. Uh, you'll look for a command line that contains key mdr.dll and the function kr show key manager. Uh, and one other way to do this is detecting on a parent process of run dll32, a process of credwiz, and a file mod of a crd file. And one thing you could do to try to mitigate this is to enable do not allow storage of passwords and credentials for network authentication. Um, that setting will prevent network credentials from being stored by the credential manager. And web browsers, this is a fun one. It's getting used more and more. Uh, I put, you know, a little lasagna meme here. You know, some people call it lasagna. I like lasagna, it's delicious. I'm gonna call it lasagna there. Uh, we got Chrome Pass and Fire password.py could be used to retrieve your browser credentials. Uh, a lot of these stealers will access the browser login data database. Um, so for Chrome, I have a list of there, it's called login data. They can take that database and save it for use later. 
uh, for detection on Linux and Mac. Uh, we've got the keychain for Mac OS and it stores all kinds of goodies in there. You know, you got the account names, passwords, private keys, certificates, payment data, that's a good one, and secure notes. Uh, so for that, you're just gonna look for security and dump keychain. Uh, and yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Uh, see that pretty frequently. And then you've got offline password cracking of the Etsy shadow and Etsy password access. Uh, you're going to want to look for adversaries reading those files. So you sub cat. Uh, you may also see them using an archive utility such as tar to compress these files during post exploitation activity. Uh, another thing to look for is the use of unshadow to combine those two files to then be cracked by something like John the Ripper. Uh, and a lot of these tools out there are also just gonna be looking for unsecured credential access. So your LinPs type scripts that are looking for privileged escalation paths on Mac and Linux. That's uh, just gonna be, you know, all these types of grep commands and reading your bash history file, hoping that, you know, somebody typed in a username and password in the command line as a parameter to a program, they're gonna look for that. Uh, they're gonna grep for private keys, they're gonna grep for SSH keys, so that way they can then move laterally. And this is more on the info stealers that have been coming up more and more. Uh, so trying to steal your browser credentials. Uh, we've seen a couple of Biter and Raccoon stealers using Telegram shortened URLs. Um, so one kind of interesting thing to look for is a process that isn't a browser and isn't Telegram connecting to that shortened domain t.me through Telegram. Because, you know, I mean, ideally there wouldn't be processes that aren't browsers connecting to that. And so if you got like an unsigned binary connecting to Telegram, definitely look into that and see what else it's doing. It's yeah, very weird. Good. No, uh, you've got other stealers that will load in specific modules that are related to browsers. Um, so the, you know, the SQLite 3.dll, mozglue.dll, these are all related to browsers. So look for a process that isn't a browser loading those in. Not good. Uh, another thing to look into. Stealers will also like make file mods into unusual directories. Um, one of them that's pretty popular is app data, local low. You can look for these file creations of passwords.txt, forms.txt, cookies.txt, screenshot, you know, system info.txt. And you know, you can look in weird places, but also if somebody's like writing passwords.txt to their desktop, you might want to look at that too and talk to them about, you know, why are you doing that, buddy? But <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, kind of looking back at the AWS metadata API, you definitely want to uh, look for requests to that API and probably things that contain something like security credentials in the URL. And again, as we've kind of been uh, continue, um, continuing to talk about look for instances where credentials intended for specific VMs or services are used by an IP address owned by a different account um, from outside of your kind of typical range or your account. So that's something that's really crucial. And you might also, again, want to kind of limit the scope of those keys as well. Um, so that they have limited permissions so that, again, even if an adversary does get access to them, they won't be able to do much. They won't have a great deal of permissions and also it's gonna get flagged instantly. For the AWS credentials file, if uh, an adversary gets access to it, they're probably gonna to want to export it. So kind of maybe something with curl or something similar where they're looking to kind of take those credentials out. And again, you can do sort of the same thing with those and sort of protecting them by looking for weird use of credentials that um, isn't within kind of typical behavior. Uh, credential stuffing in brute force is a pretty typical kind of target right now, um, but it's also pretty noisy. It's not very subtle. So multiple failed logins from the same source IP kind of within a short time frame, 
maybe the IP is again completely something that you wouldn't normally expect to see. It's in a different region. It's in a different place. So, and it's kind of something again that uh, this sort of attack is always happening. So it's really good to kind of kind of keep tabs on it. I didn't mention uh, MFA exhaustion, but it's essentially when an adversary is just continuously generating uh, multi-factor authentication kind of push notifications usually to a user's phone in the hopes that eventually they'll accept one. Again, that one is very noisy and very unsubtle. The user themselves can see it because they'll receive a bunch of push notifications to their phone, but it's something that has worked. So again, you want to kind of detect it, look for unauthenticated unauthenticated push requests within a short time frame. Look for, again, these weird IPs that are generating this request. So something to keep in mind there. Uh, for malicious OAuth applications, those are going to request excessive or high value permissions. So you might just want to flag whenever uh, a kind of an OAuth application is requesting those. And what you also want to do probably is go through and look at applications that users have granted permissions to in the past. So look for ones again that have requested these excessive or high value permissions, especially when those don't align with what the application is actually doing. Also, maybe look for ones that only a small number of users have given access to, uh, as opposed to ones that everybody is using. Maybe look for ones that haven't been authorized recently, so they're no longer necessary. And this is kind of a lot of like manual work, but there are a lot of great tools out there, like this one we linked to, that you can use to kind of filter out these apps, look for permissions that are really high value and that these applications may not need. For hybrid identities, again, this is uh, gonna depend on what you use. So if you use pass-through authentication, you're probably not going to be registering new PTA agents a lot. So that should definitely be something that is flagged. Uh, if you are using ADFS, uh, you might wanna look into suspicious or unsigned DLLs that are kind of loaded into the service. And you also might wanna look at kind of weird inconsistencies around sign-ins. So SAML login events that aren't generating IDs or event IDs that you would normally expect to see. For uh, password hash synchronization, just again, weird activity around your synchronization accounts. And uh, finally, you should also really be looking into, again, these suspicious login events, these impossible travel outside normal IP ranges, and kind of, again, look at your like Azure sign-in logs to try to find uh, information like that. Yeah, <clears throat> agree. The, there's so much gold in, in observing the logon events uh, outside of all the great telemetry you get from, from the operating systems itself. Um, they are gold when it comes to cloud and SaaS detection and response. Well, folks, um, this brings us to the end of our talk. Uh, and I wanted to give a quick shout out to Atomic Red Team. Uh, like I said, you know, we had a lot of content to go over and we're going to have a blog post following up on this uh, and, and, and really calling out all these techniques and mapping them to the test so you can test for yourself. But just a couple of quick shout outs here. Uh, you know, you see in the top left, it's just as simple as that, cat, catting the bat history and, and looking for credentials and files, right? That's that MITRE technique. Uh, on the right, everyone's favorite Garfield lasagna, uh, running lasagna to, or lasagna to, uh, to pull the browser passwords, right? You can see them there. Yes, it's that easy. Uh, and then finally, this is a really cool one. Uh, it's, a, it's a very technical concept, but the, the awesome contributors to the Atomic Red Team have gone ahead and put together these one-liners that allow for, uh, for anyone to test Golden SAML in their environment. Uh, make sure you know what you're doing before you do that in a in like a real enterprise uh, uh, account. But um, it, these are great things that that create that telemetry so that as a defender you're going to want to observe uh, and build detections around. Uh, and and the last thing I would say is, um, Atomic Red Team is always looking for contributors and specifically on cloud and SaaS stuff. Uh, we're very heavy on the Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, which is awesome. We also love seeing new. Um, contributions there. Um, but if, you, if you're sitting on cool cloud techniques or you've automated some things internally, we would love to have them uh, as part of Atomic Red Team so that everybody can benefit from uh, understanding the intricacies of detecting these cloud and sassy things. So uh, with that said, I think you should have seen a poll pop up as well. If you're still here, uh, feel free to, to, uh, to vote and, uh, and give some input into, into what you, uh, you want to see following this. And with that, 
thank you everybody for, for your time today. Uh, and we hope that you, uh, you got some benefit out of this.